Hi everyone, this is an online lecture for output and cost. The last week we studied elasticity, which is on the consumer behavior side of things. This week we're going to look at the producer or the seller side of things, which is on the output and the cost that's incurred from production. Alright, let's start. Now this chapter has a time measurement. We divide time into a short period of time or a long period of time. A short period of time, we call it short run. Now, there's definition of what makes a short period of time, what makes a long period of time, okay? Now, for this chapter, a short period of time is when the time is too short for you as a seller to change all your factors of production, okay? So, at least one factor remains fixed. So, for in a short run, okay, time is too short for you to change everything uh, in terms of your uh, factor inputs. So there's at least one fixed factor, something you, that you cannot change, all right? So short run is measured this way, short that you cannot change all your factors of production. Now long run in comparison means all input factors are variable, you can change anything, okay? Uh, of course with the state of technology constant, okay? So within that all input factors are variable, you can change all your input factors as a producer or a seller. So this is how we differentiate between a short period of time where you have at least one input factor that uh, is fixed uh, and long run where all input factors are variable. So we're going to study what happens in the short run when one factor is fixed and what happens to the output and cost of the firm. Okay. Now what you will see is um, the output and cost of the firm will be subjected to the law of diminishing returns in the short run. Okay. Now you would remember that whenever we have laws in econs, uh, law will determine a certain type of outcome which we're going to study later. Okay. So in the short run, given that there's uh, one at least one fixed factor, all right, uh, firms' output and cost uh, uh, behavior will be subjected to this law of diminishing returns. Now, before we look at the behaviors of uh, output and cost of a firm in the short run, let's have a few assumptions first. Huh? Now, we assume that there's uh, one fixed factor. That's how we define the short run, right? And we define the fixed factor to be capital, okay? And we define the variable factor as labor, okay? Um, what is fixed? What is uh, um, variable? We'll talk more about it a bit later. Now, we assume that when we talk about labor, that means uh, people working, every single individual or unit of labor are equally efficient. Okay, so everyone work as well in the same way. All right, and then uh, we assume that technology is constant. Now, in terms of output, we have two forms of measurement. One is total product. Now, total product is the total output of the firm. Okay, simple as that, all right? Total product means total output of the firm. Now, the second measurement is more interesting. Uh, marginal product. Now, what is marginal? Marginal is the additional product that you can get when you increase labor by one more unit. So, if you are the producer, you add one more worker, what is the additional product that you can generate? That will be the marginal product. Okay, it's the additional product that you can produce when you add one more worker. Okay, and this is the formula that is uh, given. So marginal product is change in total product divided by change in labor. Okay. You have this table inside your notes, huh, uh, where you have uh, labor in the first column. This is number of labor workers. Okay, when you add more and more and more, your total product, your total output will go up, right? Okay. Now, this is your marginal product, the additional. Let's take a look at how it changes. Now, when you add more and more labor, your total output will go up, okay? Now, what this marginal product measures is what is the additional output that is generated when you increase labor by one. So, let's take a look. Huh? Now, the first one, of course, nothing. Huh? Now, when you increase uh, labor from zero to one, okay? So, you add one unit of labor. Your total product, your total output increases from zero to two. So this first worker gave you an additional two units of output, okay? Now when you hire the next worker, your labor increased to two, okay? You hire the next um, 
uh, you hire the next worker, your total output increases from 2 to 8. Now, how much extra or additional units did the second worker give you? Take a look. Your total increased from 2 to 8. So, this second worker gave you an additional of 6. Okay? Now, you see how this mar marginal product is measuring what is the additional unit that's generated when you increase worker by 1. Okay? Let's do one more. So, when you uh, hire the next worker from a uh, total of 2, you increase to 3. Okay, you hire one more worker, total number of workers is 3. Your total product increased from 8 to 15. Okay, so the additional worker must have gave you an additional 7 units. Okay, so this is what marginal product measures. You can look through the rest of the table and do uh, some calculations for yourself. Now this is how your marginal product looks like on a diagram. Huh? Now on this axis we have output, okay. On this axis we have labor, number of workers, okay. Now when you increase the number of workers in the business producing a good or service, your additional product, your marginal product, okay, the additional units that can be generated when you hire one more worker initially it will go up, okay. Initially it will go up. Now you reach a point at the highest point, then you will start to fall. Now, what um, does falling uh, MP in this part of the curve means? Now, it means that when you hire one more worker, okay, the worker can give you additional units, but not as much as before. Okay, but not as much as before. Okay, until a point whereby you hire more and more workers, that worker can no longer give you any additional units, and it can even go negative. All right. So this MP curve that measures additional units, okay, will first go up, okay, and then it comes down when you hire more and more workers. So initially, you can generate higher and higher extra units or additional units when you hire one more worker, okay. When it, after a, a, a certain peak, all right, when you hire one more worker and then the next, the next, the additional units that's generated becomes lesser and lesser, falls to zero and can even go to negative. Alright, so this is how the MP uh, looks like in curve form of the diagram. Why does the MP behave in this way? Now that's because of the law of diminishing returns. Huh? Now what does the law say? The law says that when uh, we add additional units of labor, remember labor is a variable factor, okay? Uh, people working for you, that's a variable factor. When we add more and more workers to a fixed amount of capital, it says that eventually the MP must fall. Okay, this is what the law says. Now let's uh, go back to the diagram to look at the different stages of production and to identify uh, where or how does our law of diminishing returns sets in. Okay. Now this was the diagram that we talked about earlier. The MP rises and then it comes down. Okay. Now it behaves like that because of the law of diminishing returns. Now why does it go up in the first place? Now from 0 to L1, when it's going up, uh, now it's going up because there is a better combination of labor to the fixed amount of capital. Alright, now this initial stage whereby when you hire more and more workers, you are able to generate increasing additional product, okay, increasing additional output. This is because of the benefits of division of labor, or we call it specialization. Now, when you open up a shop, it's first empty. The first few workers, it can really increase a lot of output. Okay, yeah, additional outputs go up very fast because there's a better combination of labor to the fixed uh, capital that you have, like the shop space. Okay, now, now this will continue until it reach a maximum. All right, now, when you set up the shop, you sign a lease, the shop space is fixed. So after a certain number of workers, your additional units would have maxed out. Okay, from then on, this is the point from the peak onwards. This is the point whereby the law of diminishing return sets in. Okay, now uh, what happens on the second stage whereby the MP starts to fall? Now in this second stage from the peak onwards, the law of diminishing returns have set in. Okay. Now, there's too much labor in proportion to a fixed amount of capital. 
So your shop space remains the same or your company floor space remains the same. It's fixed. Huh? Short run, you can't change. Huh? And you keep on throwing more and more workers. Okay. Now, the workers will run out of things to do or run out of space to work. Okay. So the additional units that they can bring becomes lesser and lesser. Now, you come to a point whereby uh, the place is so crowded, you can't have any more additional units. Or it can even go negative. When you hire more and more workers, it prevents the existing workers from working. Okay? Now, when we look at um, your law of diminishing returns, uh, it is really a picture of overcrowding because you cannot change the floor space of the shop or the company because that is the fixed factor. All right? Capital is the amount of uh, uh, money that you use to set the business. So if you rent a place, all right, that will become the limiting factor. You sign contract for three years, four years, or five years. You must rent that place. You can't change the floor space. You committed already. So you can't change it. So this um, portion here, all right, starts to set in when there is too many workers squeezed into a fixed uh, area of space. Now, so when you look at this picture, okay, most businesses operate from a fixed floor space perspective. Okay, you cannot change floor space as and when as you want. Like, next month, I change my office. The month after that, I change again. You can't. In real life, you have to stay put in a place for a certain period of time. This period of time is called a short run in uh, Econs. Okay, so if you open a restaurant, you cannot keep adding workers, adding workers, and hope that your output will keep on going up. When your floor space cannot be changed, you run into overcrowding, and your output will be your additional output will begin to fall after a while. All right. So uh, when you look at this picture, okay, it is quite crowded. You add some more workers in, the existing workers will no longer have space to work. Okay. So when we look at this, and then we reflect back on the law of diminishing returns. Let's take a look at the diagram again. So, uh, law of diminishing returns in diagram form again. Uh. So when you start your business or a, a shop, your floor space is fixed. When there's nobody working there initially, you add workers in, your additional units will go up initially. All right, you'll reach a peak and then it will start to drop. All right, now this from the peak onwards, this is where the law of diminishing returns sets in. Okay, until uh, MP reach zero and a negative. Now we can visualize this again as a overcrowding problem. All right. Now remember, this happened only in a short run because there's a fixed factor that you cannot change. We identify this as a capital. Okay, as a fixed factor capital, and we can visualize this in the form of a fixed working space. Okay, which requires some kind of commitment. Uh, in business and you can't change that in a short run okay now so far what we have uh, talked about is what happens to your output in a short run okay now remember short run is when there's at least one fixed factor so we have talked about output uh, earlier which is affected by your law of diminishing returns now what happens to your cost then let's take a look now consider this uh, in a short run when you set up your own cafe so um, you for production to start you need to have your factors of production now remember in a short run uh, there's at least one fixed factors so you have one uh, fixed factor and variable factors let's take a look at some examples now i mentioned earlier that a short space is an example of a fixed factor right when you sign a contract to operate in a place you committed already you can't change that you can't move somewhere else all right so it is a fixed factor. Now fixed factor incur fixed cost because it's not free, man. you have to pay, right? So when you use a fixed factor like a shop space, you have to pay. So what you're paying or what is costing you, there's a fixed cost. Okay, now it's fixed because whether or not after signing the contract, whether or not you open shop, you don't open shop, you want to operate 24 hours a day. It doesn't matter. You committed that fixed amount of cost already. Okay, so it's fixed. The amount doesn't change whether you operate or not. Okay. Now you also need workers. Now how many workers you need is variable, right? So um, in this case, you decide how many workers you want to hire based on how much uh, output you want to uh, produce. 
Okay, so workers are variable. So variable uh, factors incur variable costs. Okay, depending on how much you want to hire. You don't hire anybody, then your variable cost will be zero, assuming that workers are the only variable factors you need. Now, in the short run, because we assume that there's at least one fixed factor, so you will have both fixed and variable factors in production in the short run. Okay, now because you have both fixed and variable factors used in production, you will have both fixed and variable costs. Okay, fixed costs incurred for the use of fixed factor, uh, variable costs uh, incurred for the use of variable factors. Now, the first cost that we learn will be total fixed cost. Uh, like our rental contract just now. Let's say we sign uh, for a one year rental contract, 100,000. That will be fixed, okay? And that will be our total fixed cost. All right, so that rent, okay, that we signed and we committed to it. All right, so now, total fixed cost does not change with output. You committed already. You want to produce, want to produce, you sign already, you pay. Alright, even if you don't produce anything, you must still pay for it because you committed already. Alright, so how does it look like um, when we look at uh, total fixed costs on the diagram? It looks like this. You committed a certain amount of costs. Okay, so this uh, axis measure cost and this uh, axis measure output. So it doesn't matter whether you want to produce a lot or produce zero. You commit to this level of cost already. You sign the contract. Okay, so your total fixed cost, once committed, will not change anymore. Alright, so it's one horizontal line. Okay, and um, how high is it depends on what is the amount of the total fixed cost. Now, you need your variable factors, right? Your workers, we mentioned, okay, uh, earlier. Um, and let's say you are operating a cafe, you need your raw materials, your ingredients, alright, as well as other things. All these are variable depending on how many units you want to produce. Alright? Now, therefore, variable costs change with your output depending on how many or how much you want to produce. The more you want to produce, the higher will be the variable cost. If you don't want to produce anything, there will be no variable cost. So, it depends on how many uh, or how much you want to produce. Alright? And variable cost change, changes directly with your output. So example of uh, total variable cost, uh, again, will be wages for workers that you choose to hire and your raw materials or ingredients that uh, you need to use for production. Okay. Now again, we repeat, uh, your total variable cost increases when output increases. Okay. So when you want to produce more, you have to incur higher total variable cost. When you don't produce output is zero, your total variable cost is zero. Let's take a look at how the curves look like. Now, your total variable cost looks like this, uh, okay? Um, like this kind of bending curve, all right? Now, it starts at zero uh, because when your output is zero, you don't incur any variable cost. So, it will go up uh, as your output increases. Your total variable cost will go up, okay? Now, some people look at this uh, weird S-shape kind of curve and say, how, how come it increases in a non-uniform uh, way? Why isn't it just goes up? Why must it ha have this kind of curve? Now, remember a lot of diminishing returns. Huh? Initially, when you have your specialization, you incur a bit of total variable cost, you can get a lot more output. So, you see that initially, uh, total variable cost, the way it goes up is flatter. It goes up slowly. Okay, because you incur some wages, you hire workers, they can give you a lot of uh, additional output. Alright, now, when your law of diminishing return sets in, you hire a lot of workers, cost goes up a lot, but can you see that your output is not increasing by much? Okay, because of overcrowding. Alright, so because of the law of diminishing returns, uh, your TVC, your total variable cost doesn't increase uniformly. All right, in relation to output. It's gentle in the beginning before becoming steep uh, towards the end All right, because of the law of diminishing returns. You don't really have to know this, huh, but um, just uh, because the shape is not uniform. So that's why I'm explaining. All right? Now, when we study output and cost, there's only two types of cost. Either it's fixed or variable. Okay? So your total cost comprises of your total fixed plus total variable. 
okay so when we look at uh, total cost there's only these two types now how does it look like on the diagram now this curve here that you see is your total cost all right now it looks like your total variable cost now if you remember your total cost is just your total variable plus your total fix okay now because your total fix is fixed so what you need to do is you just add your fix to your to uh, your variable to get the total all the time okay so when your total variable is zero okay your total cost is just your total fix okay because your variable is zero so your total cost starts here where your tfc is okay now when your variable increase your total will go up depending on how much your total variable go up okay this difference okay between your total cost and your total variable this uh, vertical difference is your total fix okay can you see here when your total variable is zero all right you only incur total fixed cost so that is all your total cost okay that you have because you only have fixed cost when you are not producing anything so as it goes up you will follow the shape of your tvc okay depending on how much you produce so the difference between your total cost and total variable is your total fixed so cost comprises of fixed plus variable cost only these two okay now uh, when we study output and cost we look at cost in two mathematical uh, format one is average one is total okay so far we've talked about total huh? okay total cost is just total fixed plus total variable but if we change that to average it's still the same thing average cost is equals to average fixed plus average variable okay so cost is always fixed plus variable whether it is average or total okay now you may be quite overwhelmed when you see this uh, diagram now this shows you all the average cost curves okay now we'll look at the diagram first uh, before we look at the actual measurement um, now don't worry uh, uh, we will cover this uh, in uh, much greater detail and more time will be allocated to this during the tutorial okay now uh, most of the time you only be using three uh, lines three curves your a highest u-shaped curve which is your average total cost okay and then your average variable cost will be here okay now your mc all right is like a nike tick uh this will be three lines that you'll be using now your average fixed cost uh, now remember your total fixed cost is fixed right total fixed cost is fixed so when we look at average fix uh, we divide it against a higher uh, number of units average will become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller okay although we never touch zero okay so average uh will become uh, or fixed cost will become um, smaller when your total is fixed okay now we will uh, talk more about this in the tutorial okay so don't worry about this but the three lines that we'll be using will be your average total cost curve your average variable and then your marginal cost okay let's uh, take a look at the calculation side to see how we can calculate these costs okay Okay, for average fixed cost, just take total fix divided by quantity. Now we mentioned earlier because total fix is fixed, the amount doesn't change. So when the numerator, the amount doesn't change, and Q gets bigger and bigger, all right, AFC will fall continuously over output. We saw earlier, right? AFC keeps falling and falling and falling. Okay, it keeps falling because total is fixed, and if Q becomes higher, average becomes lower and lower and lower. All right now average variable cost okay is average variable cost we just take total variable divided by quantity okay now we saw earlier that uh your abc or your average variable cost is u-shaped it goes down and then it goes up okay most of your average uh, cost curves are u-shaped now your average total cost uh is the highest u-shape that you saw uh, earlier okay how we calculate it we just take the total version divided by q okay so to get average total cost, we just take total cost, the total version, divided by Q. Or, since cost is always a fixed plus variable, we take uh, average fixed plus average variable to give you average total. One thing, uh, we uh, use average total cost and average cost as the same thing. 
ATC, AC are used interchangeably. Okay, so average total cost and average cost are used interchangeably. All right. Now, feature of ATC: the vertical distance between ATC and AVC is AFC. What I'm saying is, the difference when we take average total minus average variable, what you get is average fix. Okay, let's take a look whether this is true or not. All right. Now, you see this average total, right? It's a highest U-shaped curve. All right, average total. Now take a look at average variable. It's like this. Okay. Now can you see this difference here? This is your average fixed cost. Remember, fixed plus variable gives you total. Okay. So the vertical uh, distance between your total and your variable is your fixed. So average total on top. Average variable below. What is the distance in between? Is your average fix. Okay, is your average fix. All right. Now, when you draw um, your average total and average variable, it must look as if they are becoming nearer and nearer. See? Can you see? The top U-shaped lines, um, U-shaped curves are becoming nearer. Okay. Now, why? Eh? Because your average fix is falling and falling, right? Because total fix is fixed. When we divide against higher quantity, average fix becomes lower and lower and lower. Okay, so when we draw this uh, two average uh, cost curve, average total and average variable, the distance between them must also become smaller and smaller. Okay, because the the vertical distance between them represent average fix. Okay, so we draw them. We try to make it look as if they are becoming closer. All right. So the vertical distance between the two ATC and ABC is AFC. Okay, the difference of total and variable is fixed. Okay. Now marginal cost measures the additional cost of producing one more unit of output. Okay, so you saw earlier it's like a Nike thing. All right. Now how do we calculate it? We take change in total cost divided by change in Q. All right. So when you produce one more unit, what is the additional cost of that? Okay. Or we can use a uh, change in TVC divided by change in Q. All right. Now you must remember all these uh, mathematical uh, formats and how to calculate uh, the costs. Okay. Uh, these are very important. Okay. Now so far what we covered are the things that's going on during the short run where you have at least one fixed factor and then you have the law of diminishing returns. Okay. Now we shall now move on to talking about a long period of time. Okay, long run, where all factors of production are variable. You can change all the factors as you wish. Okay, this is in the long run. Now in the long run, just one curve. Huh? Long run average cost curve. Okay. Now we want to study why is it that um, the cost goes down and uh, up again. All right. Now um, we usually assume that companies operating in the long run are large scale companies, for example, like IKEA versus uh, furniture shop. So IKEA is a very large company. Okay, we want to look at uh, what are the benefits that uh, it enjoys when it expands output. Okay, to a large company. Now, initially, can you see that your cost is falling? Okay, your long run average cost curve is falling. All right, when your output goes up. Now, why is that so? Now that's because initially it enjoys something called economies of scale. Now this term is widely used and applied. All right, so it's important that you understand. Now economies means advantage or advantages. Okay, of scale. Scale means size. So the advantages of being a large company. Okay. Now what are some of the advantages of being a large company? They can specialize tasks. Okay. Unlike small shops where one person must do many things, they can hire a specialized person which is more effective to do something they can use large and modern machinery for example they can obtain uh, loans at low interest rate because they borrow a lot they can buy uh, raw materials in bulk all right unlike small firms that buy a little so when they buy in bulk that means cheaper as well okay so initially your cost will be falling because of all these advantages all right or what we call economies of scale However, um, when your production becomes greater and greater, the company becomes bigger and bigger, 
it goes into a second stage uh, from the bottom it goes to a second stage where we call the diseconomies of scale now it comes the disadvantages of being a large company okay now when your company becomes too large your cost starts to go up now why well, that's because the company will begin to face the problem of communication coordination and control the company becomes too large all right so large that it's hard for one ceo maybe okay to control um the production all right and to coordinate uh, different departments which may spread across the globe okay so this will increase your cost of production all right okay, finally let's take a look at um explicit and implicit costs now um this uh, part of output and cost is often used um in decision making should we or should we not do something based on the cost of making that decision of course usually we use it as a comparison should we do a or should we do b all right uh, in business studies uh, there's a branch of it uh, that's based on this that's called decision science so uh, if you're interested you can pursue that uh, in universities okay let's take a look at what this part is all about now when you make a decision uh, you will usually incur two types of costs one is explicit cost uh, whereby you're going to pay with money all right you make a decision you're going to pay for it um, in money and the type of cost is your opportunity cost okay now implicit cost means implied you don't have to pay for it in cash but you uh, have to forego it what you could have uh, without making that choice okay so this is an implied cost okay so when you make a decision you incur explicit cost which you pay money and you also incur implicit cost which is something that you must give up all right now this is an example of explicit and implicit costs incurred when for example you are working but you're considering to set up your own business okay so what is what are the uh, explicit and implicit costs involved when you choose to set up your own business so the explicit cost remember you're going to pay your own money eh? okay pay money so um for example you're going to buy machinery you're going to pay for rental you're going to pay for your worker salaries okay all these are uh, explicit costs whereby you must pay with money okay now what do you have to give up the implicit cost your opportunity cost uh if you're working you must forego your current salary you can no longer work okay so you must forego your salary now you, you used to have some money in your bank where you earn interest but now you must invest it in the company because you choose to set your own business all right those uh that amount of money could have earned you some interest if you left it in the bank all right so you have to forego that okay so this is an example of um, explicit and implicit costs when you uh, want to set up your own business okay so explicit cost is you pay money implicit cost is uh where you're going to give up uh something for this decision okay now some of the measurements that we uh, use in this section is profit huh? now what is profit profit is a net gain that you have after deducting your cost okay so when you earn something you're going to deduct your cost first all right to get your profit all right so it's a net gain that you uh, have at the end of the day uh, when you use revenue minus off your cost all right revenue is just your total takings all right how much you sell per unit times the unit that you sold right so this is your uh, uh takings of uh, how much you have sold so we define this as total revenue okay now so how do we uh measure whether should we uh, make this decision or not we have two profit uh definition one is accounting profit one is economic profit okay now for accounting profit we just use your total revenue your takings minus explicit costs okay so we just minus off um, how much you actually paid with money all right now for economic profit we take that further we use the accounting profit minus off your implicit cost i mean what you're going to give up okay to determine whether should we uh, make this decision or not now because economic profit takes um, implicit cost into account so our accounting profit is always higher or our economic profit is always lower 
Okay, now how we use this is very simple. As long as when we make a decision, your economic profit is positive. That means that we should go ahead and make the decision. If your economic profit is negative, that means there's an economic loss, then we shouldn't make that decision. All right, there's a very interesting uh, question in your tutorial about this uh, teacher that is uh, changing jobs. Okay, we can go and calculate whether should she have changed job or not. Okay. Okay, uh, this is the end of the topic. It's a long uh, topic uh, for this week. Uh. Now, many parts of it, we use it for market structure. Okay, so this is like a foundation uh, for us to uh, look at um, market structures uh, later. Okay, so uh, take your time, go through the tutorials, uh, ask questions uh, in your tutorials. I'm sure uh, with uh, practice, uh, this topic will be quite uh, straightforward to you. Okay, just need some familiarity. Okay, I'll see you guys next week.